We are live. We are live. Okay, we're gonna have those awkward couple of minutes waiting for people to join. I hope everybody is doing really well. Uh, at what appears to be almost the end of, of, of lockdown for us here in Ireland. Um, look, there's a lot going on in the world, so hopefully uh, for the next hour or so, we can take your mind off of that uh, and blend some delicious whiskey together. So we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes, let everybody join. Okay, we've already got a few eyes on us. Great. Already, which is good. So we are here in our global headquarters. We had hoped to come to you live from the rec house tonight, but we've just had a mad scramble uh, trying to reset everything up here in the office because we had some technical issues and sound issues in there. Um, so in terms of making sure that this is as good of a quality as broadcast, we figure we come into the office. Okay, we have Balfour online. Hey Val, welcome. We have Belfast Whiskey. Belfast Whiskey. That's this week, right? The whole thing. That's it. It's happening. We have got Soren from OCD Whiskey. Soren, I bet you already had a Sunday tasting today. He sure hope that went well. All right, so we have nearly 100 people online. Okay. Oh, All right, so we, I think we have about 100 people. That's really good. Should we get going? Um, all right, uh, we have about 100 of you guys online there. So I figured um, we sort of will kick off. Um, hopefully you all have your lovely little tasting kits uh, in front of you. You would have received this in the mail and then three little samples. And um, everybody was emailed, I think, a little um, uh, tasting mat, which we're going to make a couple of little amends to. But um, if you've got all your kids ready, what we're going to do first is before we dive into them, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an update maybe about ourselves here, what's been going on and, and what's happening after kind of lockdown ends as well. And then we're going to do a bit of a live blending session and just to kind of show you the methodology that has gone into the samples that you have here in front of you. Um, and then maybe give you a bit of an insight as exactly how we approach a blend and our thinking behind that as well. Um, so like I said, right when this started, we wanted to do this from the rack house tonight. Uh, we couldn't do it because we had like technical issues. So we are sitting here in our global headquarters, which is actually a converted cow shed here on the farm, uh, where we blend and mature uh, and bottle all of our whiskey. Um, this we kind of laughingly call the Global HQ because it is literally a converted cow shed. Uh, and at the moment, we're not really getting great use out of it because of social distancing. Uh, so Eric, who works here on site, is usually sitting in the blending room. Uh, and then Caroline, who's managing all of our uh, hospitality sort of efforts these days, has taken over the office and then I'm sitting in the house. So we're, we're all very kind of socially distanced. Um, but this is where we do everything from. This is where I started the business uh, back in uh, 2015, really, 2016. You know, I, I spent a lot of lonely hours um, in this particular building with the wind howling through the cracks in the door, um, plotting and um, bringing together JJ Corey. Uh, and it was from this very desk here, in fact, that kind of it, it all really, really started. Um, so yeah, I founded the business back then. A lot of you will know us and know of us. You know we're a whiskey bonder. Uh, we're not a distillery. Um, we don't distill. We never will. Um, rather, what we do is we source whiskies from all the from a lot of the new distilleries opening up around Ireland. Uh, we source new make whiskey from those guys. Um, we source our casks separately to them, and we put the flavor profile of the cask and the and uh, the new make together. And then we mature them. And then when those are ready, um, we'll be blending those to kind of, to, to, to augment out um, our flavor library, which are essentially is what we're doing here on the farm. We're just building out a big library of Irish whiskey flavors from all over the country. Um, what we also do, of course, is that we source uh, older stocks of whiskey. Um, we source uh, mature stocks from some of the older guards uh, of whiskey makers around the island. Um, we do what we what I call source living casks. So by that I mean 
you know, I do not buy lakes of whiskey or big tankers of whiskey um, that kind of come across my desk occasionally. We tend to buy whiskey that has a future to it. It's already been a cast for 10, 20 years. Um, and we, we kind of, we have the origin of the cast. We understand where the cast is going, perhaps. And we understand where it's been. Um, we look very much at individual casts of whiskeys when we, when we purchase um, older stocks of whiskey, rather than uh, big sort of huge, big parcels of, of vintages, if you like. Um, so it's a really old business model, you know, uh, whiskey bonding was really uh, central to the Irish whiskey industry throughout its entire history, um, until that history pretty much almost ended in the 1930s. And um, you'll all know those terrible, you know, terrible sort of rough, rough, rough days for Irish whiskey there in the last hundred years or so. But um, Irish whiskey bonding kind of in 2015, when I was sitting in this office, starting the business, hadn't really come back. Nobody was talking about it. Um, so I figured instead of building that big, shiny uh, green to glass distillery, which I did kind of want to build actually at one point, um, that instead I'd become a whiskey bonder. And I've never regretted it. Uh, whiskey bonding is an awesome part of the Irish whiskey industry. Um, you get to collect and curate all of these wonderful flavors from other people's amazing efforts and passion and, and, and um, creativity. So um, I'm really excited about what we're starting to build in the rec house here in terms of diversities of flavors that we're, we're laying down and, and the relationships that we're building as well with um, new makers and new independent distillers all around the island. It's kind of the lifeblood of this business and what keeps us going, I think. Um, so being a whiskey bonder right now, it's a great time to be a whiskey bonder with all the exciting things uh, that are going on in the industry. Um, do we want to stop for a question? Niamh is in the, in the in, is uh, is that, that side stage. Uh, if there's any questions, I, if, if not, I'll go on to our little vending session. Let me just have a look. All right. We have a lot of people right now saying hello, and it's pretty incredible to see people from all around the world yes. joining us in this evening. So we have got France, Germany, we have US online right now, UK, Ireland. So it's Pretty amazing to see everyone coming together right now. That's pretty really cool. People from all over the world. This map behind me, uh, before we even bottled the gale, I bought this map actually, this world map. And uh, I bought that because I knew that when we set up this business, I wanted to set, to send JJ Curry all over the world. And um, it's amazing to have you all joining us from all over the planet um, with a glass of JJ Curry. Okay, we have one question. How many other bonders are there now in Ireland? Okay, so yeah, how many other bonders are there in Ireland? There is one that I know of that has um, kind of officially started. So the, the thing about bonding is that like, it doesn't have a legal definition per se because it, it just kind of was forgotten for a long time. So our definition of it is that you have your own bond and because that's a very big barrier to entry. And what a bond is essentially is that it allows me to store and to blend uh, my whiskey in my rack house over here in a tax suspended government um, warrant warehouse essentially. And it's very, very hard to get one of those, to get a bond. Like there aren't a lot of individual bonds for, for whiskey makers that are, that are given out. Sometimes they're attached to distilleries, but just getting a bond itself is pretty difficult. So that's kind of a big barrier to entry. Um, and that's what kind of a lot where a lot of people sort of fall down along the wayside. When I got that bond, um, it was the first bond of its kind that had been granted in living memory. And uh, there's one guy in Ireland that will grant you a bond, one guy. And I went to him and I showed him the statutes from like the 1840s of, of, of what I was trying to do and what, what I was trying to achieve. And his grandfather had actually been, worked in the bonding trade for a very, very long time. And he went and he spoke to him and, um, then I had to kind of prove to him that I had, I think it was something like 110 times the cash in the bank um, or the means to pay for uh, the bond. It's this like crazy um, sort of proof of wealth or proof of capability to pay the government that you have to put down. And most people can't do that. And, you know, I, I have business partners, fortunately, who, who were willing to kind of sign over personal guarantees. I signed over a personal guarantee and, and on my guarantee form, I put down my house, my horse, and my car, because those are the only three things I really own. 
And um, we managed to get the bond in the end because a good chunk of the bond as well, they kind of look at you as a business person and they say, are you kosher? Or are you just going to make pudgy and set it out the back door? Um, so to answer the original question, there's one other bonder currently that I know of. Uh, they're called um, Flying Fly Tumbler. And they have a bonded warehouse on their family farm. Uh, and I think they're coming out with a whiskey soon. Um, we're working hard actually to try to, to get legal protection for the term whiskey bonder. Um, because we're, we're kind of trying to define what it means in a modern sense. So it means you have a bonded warehouse that you've had to work really hard to get. Um, you source new make, you source cast separately, you put those together um, and you're doing all your own blending and maturation and bottling on site. And you're essentially shepherding the casks from, uh, shepherding the whiskey from the moment it comes off the still until it goes into your bottle essentially. So quick answer is we're still the only one currently operating but I know of um, at least three others who are on their way and who will be with us in the next few years, I think. Any other questions? We have one from Mark Brownstein. Are you sourcing only Irish whiskey or do you source from other countries as well? So this is a very good question because <laughs> um, I recently actually did buy a parcel of whiskey, a, a number of casks from some in a different country. And I, before lockdown happened, I went to, um, uh, I was, I was in the, I was at the World Whiskey Forum, which happened in Seattle at Westland Distillery uh, this year. And that's, that's this amazing gathering of whiskey makers. They come together every two years. And I kind of call it the Davos of, of whiskey, essentially. It's all these new ideas and makers come together, really, and talk about what's next and what's great in whiskey. And I've, I've had a very long-standing interest in American whiskey. You know, the innovation that goes on over there and the, the, um, the, the tra trajectory that whole category has taken. But there is kind of an emergence at the moment of uh, American single malt whiskey. You know, I think it's just about to be defined as a category as well. So before all of this stuff happened and we went into lockdown and everything, I was actually very, very seriously considering uh, looking at some American single malt and putting some of that away. And as lock lockdown has kind of progressed and gone on, um, I think, you know, we, we're always going to be very, 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 very focused on Irish whiskey and building out that Irish whiskey library of flavors. But I wouldn't rule out us having an expression of a world whiskey in the future or something else, uh, because we do have a little bit in our stable now. And if, if I see something that I really, really, really like, such as the the American single mall category, if I want some, I'll go, I'll go out and find it, you know, and, and put it in the library. So, yeah, so good question. So. You know, uh, we're defining what being a whiskey bonder means, you know, why should we only just collect Irish whiskey? Like, it's, it's going to be our hardcore focus. There's no doubt about that. But um, you never know in the future. If something really good comes my way, I'll jump out. Anything else, Neva? Let's have a look. We have so many comments coming in. Oh, this is an interesting one putting you on the spot what's your favorite blend old tom old tom is my favorite blend yeah so old tom was but do we have one here no we don't um old tom was this 100 bottle blend that we did at very malt heavy um was it 100 percent? yeah i think it's 100 percent malt yeah and um it was 2002, 2006 malt, I think. And uh, it's just my favorite ever that we've ever really done. Like the Gale is my go-to. That's what I go to all the time. Like that's my lovely, easy drinker. Um, but there's something emotional about that I'm emotionally connected to when it comes to Old Tom. We did it for um, this golf tournament that was happening in La Hinch. We only did 100 bottles. And it was the first time we ever released a whiskey that people kind of went bonkers for and people were running from all over ireland in the course and everything to sort of pick it up and, and and buy it and everything and the label was really cool and the goat on it because uh goats kind of roamed the golf course in the hinge and it was just a really sort of good coming of age whiskey for us i think and I, i'm very sort of emotionally attached to it so i think that's the thing with whiskey though is like we we make a lot of blends i'm really attached to some of them um, because they have an emotional connection. Like the battalion, I'm massively, massively attached to the battalion. 
I'm massively attached as well to the Banner Blend, I think, because it's it's just a little piece of County Clare that we make every now and then. So, um, yeah, I think, but for me, when I, when I, when I get all teary-eyed about what, what we do, the old Tom definitely uh, comes to mind. I definitely have cried a lot about The Chosen as well, believe me, but that's for other reasons. Making a luxury whiskey is very difficult. <laughs> Um, but yeah, old town. Want to have one more question? One more question. Okay, this is a good one to round up on. What has motivated you throughout this coronavirus crisis? And do you feel that your business model so far will be drastically altered moving forward? Um, really simple what's motivated me is uh, we had just hit this amazing point of um, growth. You know, we were really kicking on in terms of um, global expansion almost, I would say. You know, and we had all these huge, amazing opportunities that were kind of just starting to come, you know, just, just come before coronavirus happened. My number one priority when coronavirus happened was to make sure that everybody who was working with us at the time had a job at the end of it and had, and, and had a job at the end of the end of the end of it. Like literally that was it. Number one, I didn't care about anything else really. Um, that's sort of very, it's just very important to me. Like, so we cut every single cost that we could cut. Like, like literally I lost my mind because somebody ordered some packaging one day because I was like, we can't spend any money of any kind at all. And, um, we had to, we, we, I wouldn't say we pivoted necessarily, like the business model is, is very, is a very sound one at the moment because um, we are a small tight knit team, you know, and everybody's, um, we don't have a huge distillery to run, we don't have a big gift shop, we don't have a visitor center and all that kind of stuff. So that's really stood, up, stood to us really, really well. Um, so we were a small enough team that we could all kind of stay together. And um, I think we're, we're gonna be doing this a huge amount more like we were always really active online the entire way of like building a whiskey brand and getting it out there is has been completely thrown out the window and um, it used to be that you went to nice bars and you made friends with the bartenders and then they made nice cocktails and they recommended the brands to the consumer at the other side of the counter and then they went off to buy it in their shop and that's dead now for everybody that model so we have to figure out how to connect with people in a different way and the same goes for like, we just, you know, we just signed a, we just launched in uh, Belgium and Luxembourg, for example, or we will be launching there quite soon. And normally I would go off or, or Blaze or Neve would go off and do uh, a training and a staff induction and, and a, an event to launch the, to, to, ta to taste all of our, our um, whiskeys with, with our new customers. We can't do that now. So the big change to answer your question will be um, how we interact with our customers and how, like our distributors and those kind of guys, and uh, and how we interact with consumers as well. I think that's going to be the big thing. But it's the same for everyone in the industry. I think. All right, we blend some whiskey. Yeah, we're going to blend some whiskey now. Okay, so we're going to move on to kind of the approach of how we blend and and what we do. So normally, I'm going to be standing up, so I'm going to get sitting down today. But essentially, um, all of the lock-in samples that you have today come from one of these uh, four casks, uh, essentially. So um, all of these are 7030 um, 70, grain malt blends. Um, so, and so, and when we, when we go to create a whiskey, um, we have to kind of, we, you know, it, 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 it very often comes down bare bones to what do we have in the rack house in this case, because because we were in the middle of lockdown, I had to blend this without being able to get other casks. Um, some of our mature stocks are, are not held on site. All of our new stocks are on site, but some of the more older stuff is already mature, sits off site. So um, we had to blend with, with whatever we had in the rack house. So, and we have really good, so a lot of our older stocks in there anyway. Um, so we started, you start off with your malt, right? We know we're gonna have a 30% malt component and three of these whiskeys here are, are grains. There's two 2010s, two 2010 grains. Uh, there's one 2016 grain. And then there's this one single cask of uh, 2006 malt. Um, you know, the lovely thing about Irish whiskey and the lovely thing about being a bonder as well is that there wasn't really a bad drop made, but, you know, for a very long time on, on the malt side. Uh, and I can fairly confidently say that. Like the big guys are big guys. They know what they're doing. 
and the older mall stocks that are out there from from up north or from down in Cork are pretty uh, pretty fantastic. There's no two, kind of two ways about it, and um, they just they just fundamentally are. Um, this this was an ex bourbon cask. The one thing I will say is that there was a bit of not dodgy, but like cask programs weren't top of mind at ever, of everybody's head. I think for a long time in Irish whiskey. Um, so for that reason, very often you don't get uh, too much cask influence actually coming out uh, of those kind of older malts, which is a, which is a good thing. So it's easier to balance it. Um, this 2006 is pretty much an absolute kind of classic um, Kari style, you know, and, and Kari style for us are big kind of juicy tones, essentially fruity kind of lovely, big fruity sort of flavors. Um, uh, blackberries and mangoes and, and forest kind of fruits and stuff like that that you kind of tend to get in Irish whiskey. So the first thing that we did for this blend is we pick our um, malt component essentially. So every cask that we have is um, uh, classified into, I'll just give you a, a wink of this here because I have it actually. Every cask that we have is classified into a flavor block and this is an old classification we, we reclassify them every two years um but they're kind of classified like this this is really messy but it's like green block and then it'll have a code beside it it'll have the cask number and it'll go um a b c d f right and all of those kind of um classifications correlate to a uh, a flavor type essentially sometimes it's grassy sometimes it's estuary sometimes it's vanilla sometimes you know it can be there, there's a number of them we have about 19 different ones i think um, and then we reclassify those every two years because we have living whiskey in cask so it's evolving all the time and it's changing so sometimes we'll pull stock out of the blending rotation even if it's 2006, because we know that that, that could actually probably grow up to be 30 years old, so we're gonna park it, essentially. Um, and then there's certain cases where we have some of our older stocks are kind of either, like they're great, but they're not brilliant, and uh, they might be kind of going that direction, so you need to pull them out pretty quickly and then start blending them, essentially. So we landed on our 2006 component, great. Let's park that now for a second, because where the differences come in your blends, and um, these are all 30% moss, right? They're all this 2006 cast, that nice kind of fruit tones to it. So then where the difference comes in is in, is in the grain components essentially, and the, um, the ratios of the, the grain components. So what we do here a lot of is, and this is kind of how we blend, is that when we create a whiskey, any whiskey at all, of any level of complexity, and most of ours are very complex, the first thing that we do is, is we create separate component vattings, right? So, um, and, and the easiest way to explain this in this case is to kind of just basically show you, right? So each of these individual casts, it's like two 2010s uh, and then a 2016 are very unique and different, you know, kind of in and of their own uh, right, essentially. Um, and, you know, you look at those individual components and you figure out what do you want to pull essentially from from those kind of components. So the 2016 kind of has nice kind of ginger notes to it because a lot of our a lot of our um, 2016s are showing like that at the moment. They're starting to change pretty quickly now. Um, and then these two 2010s are lovely kind of crackers of, of casks, I think. Um, there's a bit of kind of vanilla going on. I said there's a bit of banana even kind of in there to some degree. Um, so they're, they're showing kind of very differently, but they as, as some of their parts can become quite interesting. Uh, so the first thing we do then is go, okay, we've got these three completely different casks. And if you imagine in the gale when we're doing this, we'll have, you know, 50, 60 casks or probably more that we'll be backing together. But this is a very kind of uh, small, smaller version of it. So first thing we're going to try is we're just going to do a third, a third, a third um, equal components of this particular cask, of this particular blend. And this is actually what went into um, uh, blend number one that you have there. So, and this is exactly how we do it when I'm in the rack house, when we're doing a component blend. It's a lot of um, gradiated cylinders, essentially, like this. A lot of beakers, gradiated cylinders, um, and there's a lot of math involved. Like, usually I have my calculator in front of me, but that my calculator is my phone, and that's what's, how I'm filming this. Um, but you, you just calculate, okay, if it's a third, a third, a third, let's say we want 30 milliliters, we're just going to do 10, 10, 10. 10 milliliters of each, essentially. Um, 
Ooh, this is a nice bit of char in that one. Um, you're very lucky if you've, if you've received char in your samples. It's it's um very good for you, and it's 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 good luck. All right, so we'll just do ten, ten, and ten for a third, a third, a third. And after this, now I'm just going to ABV this to understand where it is. Okay, so so this is our green vatting A, right? We'll give it a good old stir there now for 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 the moment. So um, so this is going to comprise seventy percent of the entire blend. So this is the heart of the blend. Um, and this is where we're gonna get our kind of variance from, I think. All right, and then at this point, like normally this goes on over a period of days, obviously, as you can imagine, because you're working in much larger bits. Um, but for the purposes of this, for, for sampling, you know, what we tend to do when we do a vatting is, we create the vatting, we put it in a tank, we walk away. And you just let it settle and you let it all kind of get to know each other. And, and you know, we're not proofing at this point at all. We're just disgorging um, three different casts in different ratios. And then we have this big batching sitting there. And then we just walk away. We don't do anything fast around here um, because it's the West Coast of Ireland. And our approach is sort of like a slow food approach. It's like a measured, contained, slow approach to making whiskey where we let everything kind of take its time and breathe. We're not dumping huge, big, you know, big tankers of whiskey into tanks. We are literally popping and disgorging individual casts and partially disgorging them very often. So that takes time, and we let the whiskey kind of get to know each other. And then and back in the old days, anyway, that, that that was pretty standard operating procedure, like letting letting whiskey sit to sort of get to 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 know each other. And the way that we stir it normally in tank is that we literally will have a big paddle, and we're just like stirring around, and then we'll open it the next day, and then we'll give it another stir. Open it the next day, give it another stir, and then maybe it's kind of ready to start to, to blend. All right, so this is going to be, um, I'm going to ABV this real quick. This is our magic machine. For those of you who haven't seen me work, work this before, um, I used to proof all of our whiskey using hydrometers, and I used to prove it very inaccurately using hydrometers because hydrometers are very difficult to use. So I invested in this little piece of kit, and it's called a Snap um, 41. Uh, Anton Parr are the people who do all of the proofing globally, basically, for any kind of, they do it for rocket fuel even and stuff like that. So they're, they're kind of a scientific instrument company and they created, thank God, this great little kind of gun um, uh, for craft uh, distillers in the US actually was the original market. And I was over in the US and I saw it and I was like, I need one of those things. So um, we got one, quite a big investment for us, but we use this every day, literally. So you just take a little sample and um, it goes into this chamber here and then it kind of magically adjusts, you just hit, you go beep, beep, boop and press the button. And then it, it will magically adjust essentially the, um, uh, the temperature and uh, to, to give you a very, very accurate uh, measure, measurement of ABV. So this is showing us 60.68%. Um, and, and that's showing high now, probably most likely because of the younger uh, grain that's in there. Uh, the younger grain is going to be well into the 60s, so um, you're, you're, you're showing this at 60%. So we know that's kind of our, our, our standing point. So we know, look, this is going to blow your head off at 60-something percent, 61%. But, but um, you know, the, we're, we'll, um, we'll assess this batting, essentially. And it's not really coming out at in the 60s at all. You know, the alcohol is there, but it's not the pervasive, um, it's not the pervasive tone that you're getting at all. And that's because of maybe the older 2010 that's coming in, that's kind of calming it down a bit. You know, there's a nice bit of spice there, all right. Oh, my dog is barking to be let in. We better let the dog in. <laughs> there she comes. There's still that lovely sort of vanilla there. Um, it is, there, there is a nice kind of hit of spice on it, definitely. Um, 
but that's showing actually well balanced, like rega- sort of regardless, even for 60 something percent. Um, I'm even getting, it's, it's softening a little bit. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of water into this. I'm just going to add a little dribble in to take it down a notch. We normally bottle at 46%. So we, and the only reason that we do that is it just kind of became a magic number for us. Um, we don't chill filter and we uh, don't add artificial color as well as an aside, but at 46%, uh, it's just not necessary to chill filter anyway. Um, so, some of our whiskeys, like they do, uh, they go down even further. They, they can go to like 43%, 41%. We kind of tend to proof at what the whiskey tells us to proof it at. And very often in our portfolio, that comes in at 46. It's just like a little magic number. Okay, there's, there's quite a lot of spice there on that on the finish. So I think a bit of water here. Um, I'm just going to add a little dash just to take it down. I'm just going to try the ABV on that um, just for the hell of it because that's exactly what we do anyway. All right, that's down to 45.4%. So that's nearly there or thereabouts where, where we kind of hit it. Um, not too bad. All right, and that's really opening up now. There's like some nice cinnamon going on there as well. And that sort of banana, banana kind of, um, really almost like a banana, banana's force are nearly coming through already on the nose. Yeah, that's a whole, you know, we're really in kind of in a, in a much, a whole new space there. Um, yeah, there's definitely, it's like banana, toffee, that kind of upfront sort of spice that was lingering there on the original finish is totally gone now. Uh, and we're, we're in an almost kind of a caramely sort of, like banana sparster is really what kind of comes to mind for me, that kind of caramelized banana with, with that that you, you, you know, you roast on the top and, and then it's, it's unctuous and creamy kind of thing. So that's kind of our base. So normally now in the process, so we've, we've got our vatting, it's sitting in a tank, let's just imagine. Um, and we know that's the core of our blend. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the, the meat and bones of it. And, um, you know, knowing this cast, as we know this cast and the profile of that, that's something that could work, right? And that's, that's the process that we take. So there were a number of other, you know, vattings besides these three that we had, had worked on prior. Um, but these are the ones we kind of landed on that would make for a good um, uh, foundation or support system, if you like, for the malt that's going to go into it. Um, so then in any blending process, it's very simple. The next thing that we do is we'll, um, uh, we'll just add in the, the malt, essentially. And again, we need our gradient cylinders. So let's just see, 730, I'll have to do some math on this. Any questions coming through while we're at it? Sure. So teeny tiny cylinders are good for, for, for very, very small blends like this. You can get your ratios right. So now I know that I have my this is my, this is going to be 70% of the entire blend. And then the moth is going to be 30% of the entire blend. So now we're onto the, the ratio of the entire blend as opposed to um, the initial piece. So it's interesting to see a few people are sampling blend one with a few drops of water added to bring down that ABV. Yeah as blend number one does have an ABV of 52%. Yeah, it's at 52%. Yeah, I think we took them down, down a little bit. Now, I would recommend, I think that, like, it, even if we go for blend number one, um, we're probably going to bring it down to around the 46 mark, to be honest with you, because of the effect that water has on it. Um All right, so all right, so this is our total blend here now. This is our 7030. 
malt grain. And normally what we do in a big tank, um, we'll add it in, we'll stir it, we'll walk away, we'll stir it again, we'll walk away, we'll stir it again, we'll just kind of let it sit for a while. Um, and we'll just kind of let it sit and marry, you know. Um, we're, we're, we, I believe in marriage and... Uh, <laughs> I think I, I remember being at a distillery not that long ago actually and, and somebody we had just they put something in, in a tank or whatever we had done I think it was the first deal that we ever made we had to make it off site and somebody said to me d d d does anybody marry anymore and I was like well we do um just because I think everything needs to just a bit of time to sort of get to know each other and and, and uh amalgamate essentially okay so then this is the sum of its parts here really yeah, and this has gone into a very different place now. There's like touches of um, kind of almost a smiky sort of spicy sort of an oak going on, and that cinnamon is really in there. Definitely, spice is back. Definitely. But still that kind of, there's still those kind of hints of vanilla a little bit there as well. And if I ABV this now, let's just see where we're, where we're at on this. It's going to be the 52 is where it should be there, there it is. Yeah, so this is sitting up in the 52 mark essentially. So I guess it, like you, if you're already tasting it, guys, I think you should go ahead and with number one and um, you know get in there. I'd be interested to know what you think. Um, I do think the addition of water again. I'm going to add a little here. Um, takes us into a very kind of different place. Like I'm pretty sure when I add this water now, we're going to that kind of banana toffee piece is going to come back to us a lot, and we're going to mellow out that kind of cinnamon kind of. Um, spiciness that we have so i would definitely say add a couple of drops of water in there because it, it it comes to life a lot better i definitely think at a lower dv but we want to kind of share with you the um uh you know the cast strength uh samples because this is always our starting point yeah this has this has come out yeah this this comes back out now again very much okay so we have a few tasting notes coming in we have orange and white pepper. Yeah, I almost get a bit of a Christmas orangey kind of situation going on with this, like almost like a cloved kind of spiced orange too, I think, this. Yeah. Jordan Quinn says, lovely light peppery spice, very creamy. Yeah, that's that banana forester kind of thing, I think. Um, that's coming out of the grain, definitely. Christy Sherry says, much more dessert-like with the addition of water. Yeah, you come out of those kind of spicy, cinnamony tones and you're, you're going into that, that uh, dessert-y, creamy uh, area, definitely. And do you guys like that? Like who, who, who's, um, what are your opinions? Do you like that sort of dessert-y banana, like caramelly kind of uh, toffee sort of note? Be interested to know. Yeah, and it's the blend with no star on it. So yeah, you guys have you guys have three of these little vials. There's um one with no star on it. That is what we're tasting right now. All right, I'm gonna clear my tail a little bit here. Whiskey bonding is not conducive to a tidy desk. No, it is not. <laughs> Definitely not. Okay, lots of banana notes people are picking up on. Creamy, buttery banana is another flavour note coming through. Yeah, you know, banana is a really interesting thing in Irish whiskey. You know, there's like a town in Philadelphia, I think, that specialises in uh, a very well-known Irish whiskey brand um, uh, infused with bananas and they sell it uh, by the by the measure essentially so that kind of tonality um, in Irish whiskey like you see it you see it all the time it's really interesting 
Um, and, and we we have quite a few banana-esque sort of ca casts going on at the moment now as well, which is good fun. I love it as a profile. Like it's it's something that I um I love it when it gets kind of petered out with more kind of spicier notes as well. It's just a it's just a familiar kind of flavor profile as well for people, I think. Okay, Christoph just wrote in a very detailed description, which is lovely. Um, on the nose, very fruity, banana, mango, tropical fruits and cinnamon, palette, creamy, peppery arrival, ginger fruits from the nose, very good. Great. We concur. We concur, definitely. Yeah, cinnamon and banana, like what could be better than that, by the way, as a flavor combo, pretty good. Okay, um, what are we supposed to do now, Neil? Two minute break for questions or before we move on to the, the, the rest of the tasting? Let's have a run through on questions. A lot of people are still writing in their flavor notes. Oh, good. There is a lot of chewing and fawing on those who prefer it at its class strength and those who like the addition of water. What's our overarching, um, what you, would you say it's 50-50 or? For now it's looking pretty 50-50. Yeah, we don't do a few, like we, we'll do cast strength. Um, we've done quite a few of them, we have done, but like we, again, we just tend to sort of listen to the, we listen to the proof and we listen to the whiskey. And normally when we're, when we're blending we we'll started out of cast strength in terms of proofing when we when we taste it, and then we take it down um, as, as in samples of two percent. So it, let's say it starts at fifty five percent. We'll taste it at fifty three percent. We'll taste it at fifty one percent, and we'll kind of work our way down. And 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 we then just sort of honestly, what we tend to do is just pick the one that works best. Essentially, that's what we always do. So we have a question in from MC Drummer. What water do you use for proofing and how long do you marry with water before bottling? Okay, so controversially, I'm not a massive, huge, inordinate believer in the addition of water at this juncture. Um, in terms, it, it, I, think, I think water at the fermentation, fermentation stage of whiskey is really important. In Ireland, you are legally obliged to use uh, water that's been completely demineralized and that has gone through a reverse osmosis machine, right? So the function of a reverse osmosis machine is to take everything out of your water, essentially. So even if you're digging it from a, a well 200 meters below the rack house, um, you're gonna go, you're gonna put it through a reverse osmosis machine. So we use the water from the reservoir here in Corey Clare, essentially. Uh, it's local water, I mean, it's local rainwater, but we're putting it through a reverse osmosis machine. So there's not a lot going on when it goes in. So the way that we proof, um, you know, I was talking there just a second ago about how we taste everything in 2% increments. We proof incredibly slowly, right? So it takes weeks about for us to make, um, you know, 200 liters of whiskey, let's say, because we're letting everything marry at every single stage. So the vacuums are gonna marry and then the blend is gonna marry. And then, and then we're gonna start proofing. And we proof at 2% at a time. So if we have a whiskey in tank and we know that it's 55% and we want to get it down to 46%, that's probably going to take us seven days, six or seven days to proof because we're only adding two, we're only adding water sufficient enough to dilute at 2% at a time. So the answer to your question is, is that like, um, again, we kind of listen to the whiskey. We just go super slowly and take it down bit by bit by bit. But, you know, our, our whiskey is just like sitting in tank for, for weeks and weeks and weeks before it goes anywhere near, near bottling, you know, sometimes months actually, but that's just maybe because we don't have our act together and, and we, the labels are late or something. Um, but nothing, nothing gets proved and then put immediately into bottle. Um, we're pretty slow about it. All right. We have what style cask is the blend finished in? From so, Nathan Evans. Yeah, so all of these casks, so the malt, um, uh, so the malt cask is like probably a second, third fill ex bourbon cask essentially. And uh, the reason I say probably is because um, most of those casks were that, because I didn't buy the cask myself, the, the wooden cask, I don't know. 
Um, the 2016 is the Jack Daniels cast. It's the first Phil um, X Bourbon Jack Daniels cast. I know that because I sourced that my, that cast myself. Um, and then the two 2010s again are second Phil um, uh, X Bourbon casts as well. So it's all these are all X Bourbon casts. They're very kind of traditional um, traditional Irish whiskey casts. In terms of like, we don't exactly finish it in a cask. What we'll do is we'll blend this and then it'll sit maybe in a cask, a fairly inert cask, depending on if we have tanks left or not, or it'll just sit in a tank for a while. But they're all coming out of individual casks and then going into a tank in theory. All right. We move on to blend number two. Yeah, blend number two. Okay. All right, so you have a you have a tasting mat in front of you, right? So um, I want you to ignore the blend breakdown at the bottom of the tasting mat because we're, what we're gonna it just gets confusing because we're gonna talk about the exact blend of the individual casts rather than grain versus malt. So I'm gonna give you a bit more of a complicated breakdown. So just ignore the the um, the blend breakdown that you have there. I'll just talk you through what you have. But again, you're starting here in blend number two, which is what a silver star. So the silver star, that's the one that you want, essentially. Um, you know, it's the same four casks again, but this time we have um, different ratios going on. So in the last, uh, in, in, the, in, in the first thing that we had, uh, we have our vatting, our 70% uh, grain vatting. It was made of a third, a third, a third, of the 2010 casks and the uh, 2016 grain casks, these guys, not these guys. So um, 30, 30, 30, it was just like 33%, 33.3, 33.3, 33.3%, okay? So this has changed in this, in, the, in this instance, this is completely different vatting. So the vatting on this is 50% um, uh, of the, um, the 2016 grain and then 10% of cask uh, 4252, which is a 2010 grain, and 40% uh, of uh, cask 4255, right? So that's the breakdown for that particular vatting. It just basically does mean it's like, it was actually 50% 2010 grain, and then 50% 2010 malt. But again, because these all have different components going through them, the, the, the the ratio is different, right? And that's what's giving you the differential in these blends. And you'd be very surprised to see um, the differential as we sort of go through the tasting. Uh, and then the remainder, of course, is 30% um, of the 2006 malt, that lovely fruity malt. Okay, and I'm gonna grab mine actually and taste it through with you. So this is at 55%. Uh, that's where we're at with this, 55%. So um, we are actually probably going to take this down to even below 46%, potentially. Um, we're thinking maybe it can probably, it probably might be happier at uh, 43%. Um, so I would definitely certainly taste it first of all, and then um, then go in at it with a good, a good dollop of water, I would say, to take it down. And if you have both of them side by side as well, where did my first one go? Yeah, I think side by side, always good comparison. This is definitely hotter for me. It just feels hotter on the alcohol, certainly already, even even on the nose. Um, it is it's two percent, it's three percent more, but it feels like it's a little bit more. Way hotter, way hotter. Um, then you're getting you're getting spice. You're getting um, lovely kind of Christmas spices. Definitely sort of nice Christmas spices coming through, and nice kind of melange of them. Reminds me a little bit again of that clove orange kind of thing. But this this is this is um, I think this is too hot to be honest with you. I mean, you guys might disagree, but I'm going to add water now and just see what happens. Um, if you want to, I would suggest you do the same. Um, but this definitely evolves uh, quite a bit. Um, it's kind of it's quite crisp as well. It's, 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 it's kind of a kind of a crisp oak sort of tannic piece then going on as well at the finish, which I actually happen to really like. 
because of my old wine days um, working in the wine industry. Okay, I've added a good dollop of water there now. I might actually ABV that and see where we land. We are getting a lot of love for this blend. Oh, we are? T t tell me what people are saying. Give me, give so, me Christy Sherry says, oh my God, the nose on blend two is giving me life. Baking spices, linseed oil, florals, orchard fruits. That's great. That's pretty good. That's good. Mark Gillespie is commenting in. Our friend from Whiskey Cast. Yeah. So, me, I prefer this to blend number one in terms of spice and complexity. Don't screw this one up by taking it to 43%, Louise. <laughs> well, if Mark says... Don't, don't pull your punches, Mark. Don't pull your punches. <laughs> I didn't say I was going to. I said we were thinking about it. But remember, <laughs> this is a crowdsourced blend. So if that's what the crowd was saying, then we are going to have to listen to the crowd. Um, anything else? Yes, we have Whiskey Wednesdays. Number two is amazing. So we're getting a lot of love for this. People agree it is a hotter blend, but they're surmising that it's down to the ABV, but they're really picking up on the sweetness. Yeah. I think like uh, after a bit of water, um, that the spice kind of downgrades to nutmeg almost, I think. Not downgrades, but evolves into kind of more something more nutmeggy and then... Mm, like I get pear, I definitely get pear then with a little bit of water added in, I'm definitely getting pear and that kind of crispiness kind of down uh, changes as well into that sort of um, um, pear uh, sort of almost almost mouthfeel, that sort of uh, textured kind of mouthfeel I think. It's still very satisfying though I think. So yeah, anybody else feeling good at the 55% mark? Um, do you think this should go ABB down or stay the way it is? What do you guys think? We're getting a lot of stick to 55%. Whoa, okay. And I will tell you, like, we're going to go back through all of these comments after um, this week, like after we're done here and take all of them on board and all of them are, are going to are gonna uh, affect the, the final blend, essentially. So we're hopefully by the, you know, after we're finished here tonight, you'll have an email on your inbox, which is, which is asking to vote for the blend that you want, but get your opinion in, in terms of ABV for everything like now, uh, because we'll literally trawl through everything and we'll take all of that very much on board. Um, you have the opportunity here definitely to influence where we go. Like, you know, it, it's very easy sometimes as well when you're, I think I blended this when I was all alone. Like this is like proper lock-in stuff as well. All of the samples that you had, I think we're blended in the second week of lockdown when the site was completely closed and I was here all alone. And um, maybe I, I, I could have gone maybe a bit stir crazy too. So, you know, you, you get a house style and a house palette in your head. So if you're loving the 55 and, and the higher ABV on it, we can look at that for sure. But I love this one as well. But I, um, my, my favorite actually is coming up, not to influence anybody. Um, so we have Brian Houston saying, water has opened it up without losing the intensity. If anything, the spice has ramped up ginger, clove, and some baked pears to balance it. Very good, yeah. I agree with you on the pear for sure. Yeah, the spice is, um, it's there, but like I said, for me, it moved on into a different kind of, different arena. Any other notes? We have a lot of toing and froing about whether it should be 55% ABV or not. People are really going at it in the comment <laughs> section. <laughs> Listen, whoever shouts loudest is going to win on this one. So, um, <laughs> we normally do what Mark Gillespie tells us to do anyway. So he, he, he's a pretty big voice. We listen when Mark talks, for sure. <laughs> it's interesting to see people are picking up on other fruits, such as pear and more orchard tones compared to the tropical fruits yeah. of blend one. Yeah. We have pickled pear along with nutmeg and clove dusting. 
I'm an like Adrian. Yeah, I'm with you on the nutmeg all the way, all the way. All right. Um, blend number three. Blend number three. Blend number three is a gold star. It's a gold star. Okay, so blend number three. Again, forget your blend breakdown on your tasting notes. I'm going to give you a long-winded explanation on this one again. Uh, it's actually pretty simple, this one. So this was a, this is, um, it's at 53%, first of all. Um, and then this one is, it's 50-50. It's so it's 50% of the 2016. So we actually only used two of the grain casks in this particular batting. And we used 50% of um, the 16835, which is the 2016 cask. And we used 50% of the 4255, which is a 2010 cask. So it's just two of those in, the, in that kind of original vatting. And then those two comprise 70% of the total blend. And obviously, again, the malt is at 30% again on that. And showing at 53 did I say 53%? Yeah, 53%. This is 55% ABV. It's 55%, sorry. I, I don't know if my glasses is on. 55% ABV. I can ABV it here. I don't know if can be sure. Um, okay, let me just ABV it to be 100% sure. Okay, hey, pour away, guys. I'm just checking my ABV. Yeah, I've got 55 on this as well. Okay. All right. Little, little, little tiny, tiny, little couple of points lower than 55. I'm very, pretty much there. All right. So um, I like this one as well. Actually, this is one of my uh, interesting ones. I think it's a lot softer, even on the nose. Like that heat um, is already kind of gone, I think. And I'm getting spices on this straight uh, way. Um, cumin and cinnamon again, definitely. Yeah, so that younger the balance on that younger uh, younger grain as well is really interesting for me. So I I I'm I have, I have a soft spot for our younger grain casks. To be very honest with you, the 2016 grain that we have is showing beautifully right now. So what I get with this, I get those kind of it's it's definitely softer um, than both, but than, certainly than than number two, definitely without a doubt. But I, I do get those cumin and cinnamon kind of tones. But then there's a burst of fruit, and it's a different kind of fruit for me. Um, there's definitely grapefruit in there um, and then almost like a Japanese yuzu, that kind of delicious sort of tart, tartness kind of through it, I think. Um, I, I, you know, I'd add water to this as well and I'm, and I'm going to uh, because I, it, it evolves. But I, I, I particularly like this one, I have to say. What do you guys think? What, what's, the, what's the thinking? So Mark Gillespie says dark chocolate on number three, followed by a nice burst of spice, almost like a chili pepper infused chocolate bar. Nice. Craig Lancaster says foam bananas. Foam bananas. Foam banana. I love a foam banana. Craig, so glad you're here. Shout out to Craig. <laughs> we love you, Craig. We love you, Craig. Um, Craig Lancaster, who is on the line, is actually the designer behind all of the JJ Carey labels. Uh, he and I have known each other for a million years, and he has been with us uh, since the very, very beginning of the JJ Carey journey. And normally we forget to send him all of the whiskeys, so I'm really glad that <laughs> we sent him a pack this time, because we usually leave him out, unfortunately. Okay, I'm adding water now. I'm, kind of, I'm going to go in. Um, any other notes from people? Um, Paul Kennedy says it's a richer, creamier drink for him. 
Um, we have a bit of leather, spicy, acidic toffee, lighter on the palate. Mm. So someone who isn't from Ireland or the UK is asking, what's a foam banana? Gosh, how do you explain to a, a, an American? Yes. So a foam banana is, they're probably illegal now, right? But they were like a form of confectionery that we ate as children. And they're, they're yellow and they look like bananas. And they're kind of chewy, they're kind of marshmallowy, but they have a tough exterior. And they, they are reminiscent of a banana in the same way that a, a, a monkey is reminiscent of a couch. Like it's, it's, it's there, but it's not exactly there. Um, so a very difficult one to compare to. What would you compare that to in American parlance, let's say? Um, trying to think of a candy. Uh, you know what? How about, like, they're kind of like candy corn, right? They're kind of like, they're in the, the, the wheelhouse of candy corn, but they taste a bit different. But that's the kind of uh, wheelhouse of, of, of flavor profile that you're in there. Like, like Halloween candy corn, I think. Brian is asking, is anyone getting a coastal briny note, salty caramel? He says it's delish. Yeah, I get, I get like, when I add water to it, I'm definitely, I'm getting, I'm, I, I'm all, I am actually getting a bit of the foam banana situation, almost like a marshmallowy thing for me, to be honest. Um, I, I like this one a lot. Like this is, this is, uh, this is, this is my kind of, um, this is my sort of thing at the moment. Like I'm, I'm really sort of into it. And, and again, it's because of that love of the, of the 2016 green that I have so much. But yeah, that kind of marshmallowy thing is a good shout and uh, uh, Craig, you know, that kind of um, sort of off color sort of fruitiness to it. Like it's really interesting. Any other major shout outs? Should we, should we, um, Take a couple more questions, maybe, and then see how people are feeling. So, yes, we are getting a lot of people picking up on salted caramel. Mark says he picks up on salted caramel, caramel after a few drops of water. Nice. Niall Worth says, number three is very spicy, really dances on your tongue, long lasting finish. Bottle all three, please. I'll drink them all. We can't because it's only four <laughs> It's like we don't have enough cat. It's a very small blend. <laughs> so yeah, I think we're probably gonna bottle this. Um, we'll bottle it as soon as we can. Like it's in our agenda. You know, it'll take us uh, couple, maybe like a month and a half or two months to get it out the door. I think. But Craig is actually working on a label for it as we speak. So we'll kind of keep you up to speed on that as well. And um, everybody, and you'll get an email from us around the kind of label design as well. You can have a bit of input to that if you like to. Um, and we'll probably end up bottling this. It depends on which, okay, so honestly, it depends on kind of which, uh, which sample that we go for, um, what we bottle this in, because there's less, some of these casts have been partially disgorged in the past. So there's like X amount of liters that we have to play with. Um, but we'll either do this in a, a 500 mil style or a 375 for the US or um, uh, 700 or 750 for, for the US size bottle. And we'll probably make it available through irishmalls.com um, just because a lot of our normal on-premise outlets are, are shut to us. I think the guys um, will, will maybe have a different outlet for it um, in the US, maybe Flavier, but uh, probably irishmalls.com just in general. Um, so speaking of Irish malls, John is actually on the stream and he did give us a shout out earlier on. So without them, they made it happen with us. Yes, so awesome. I want to give a huge shout out to John at Irish malls. Uh, John at Irish malls and I kind of were talking even before, I think even before you set up Irish malls, John, way on the way back. And we kind of started working together very almost immediately. Um, I can't say enough about the great work that irishmoss.com do to make Irish whiskey and particularly small independent makers of Irish whiskey accessible globally. Um, he's a pretty phenomenal businessman. I have to, I have, my hat really has to go off to him in terms of what they've managed to achieve 
Um, they're an amazing retail outlet for us. You know, we managed to launch the Hanson uh, in the middle of this lockdown and we did it exclusively through Irish malls and it's made its way all around the world. So um, if you really want to keep your finger on the pulse of all of the new kind of indie distillers and new makers coming out of Ireland, um, irishmoss.com is definitely a place um, to hit up because they have built great relationships with everybody around the island. They support the new and upcoming guys and they give us a much needed outlet um, uh, for distribution. So hats off uh, to John and Irish Moss uh, for making this happen. He His crew sent out all of these samples. I made them, but then we shipped them all off down to Cork and he managed to, 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 to send them all over the world. Not something we're capable of doing. So thank you very much, John. Okay, so we have one question in from our friend Alistair. Will the label reference it being crowdsourced? Yes, yes. I'm going to have to have a huge argument now with the, <laughs> the label people <laughs> here in Ireland about this. Because every time we have a label that has anything different on it, I just get dragged through a bush on it. But I will definitely <laughs> make sure that um, label is a very hot topic for, <laughs> for us. I will definitely make sure that it says that. Yeah, for sure. Like, this is a really cool thing. Like, I can't thank you all enough, like, for just being there at the other side of, um, you know, the screen. It means a huge amount to us. Like, we are all about transparency. And um, we've always been all about transparency because it's just how we think um, the whiskey, our whiskeys should be communicated. You know, we want you to know what goes into making our whiskey. We want you to know the exact cast numbers and the proportions and the ratios. So hopefully we can um, do a lot more of this in the future. Like we've been toying with the idea a long time of having a live, actual big scale of blending session. So we'll probably do that at some point. So you can kind of dip in and out while you're at your office at work and see us blending a whiskey. So, um, and yeah, just a very big thank you to you all for being involved in this. So, of course, we'll be referencing you uh, on the label after we have a massive fight with the label people. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a really good question in from Lori. Will the tasters on here tonight get an early access to the successful blend? Yes, definitely. 100%. We'll work something out with you guys to ensure that if, if you want to... Um, get the blend we'll, we'll ensure that, that you do so leave, leave that with us but you know we we've 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 got your information and we've got you on our mailing list so we'll ensure that you have a heads up and a dibs on anything that goes out long before anybody else has long long before so we'll make sure that's the case okay we have one more question are we going to bottle this out of 500 mil or 700 mil so it's going to depend on what we what we um what we pick because of the volumes that we can do. So it'll I well what would you prefer? Why don't you say in the comments what you would prefer? Like you can't sell five hundred mil in the United States. It has to be three seven five. There's a whole thing, but we'll work around that. So if you guys let us know, would you prefer five hundred or seven hundred? You know we can look at that. We just have to figure out our exact yield. Um based on which blend we pick essentially because we have one of the casts is kind of is, is, is running low and um, so that'll kind of ascertain give us an idea of exactly how what what milliliter we bottle at is at essentially okay so a lot of people now are sending in their tasting notes and opinions on blend number three yeah let's hear them it seems to be quite neck and neck with the love for blend number two I feel like number two was a big was a big winner there, like more so than number one even. Like I feel number two was was um, well up there. Ooh, we have one question in from Adrian McGuire. Any word on Whiskey Live going ahead this November? No, I don't think it's happening at all. I think they already said no. Um, maybe that was the Irish Whiskey Awards. I don't know. Okay, so we have some whiskey bonders at home riffing off on sample two and three. Could we do a hybrid of two and three? I've just experimented myself. That's in from Conor Mulcahy. <laughs> oh God, we, um, oh, let me look at the ratios. Da, 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 da. All right, so let, okay, well let's look at that because this is always the kind of conversation that comes up when we do these blending sessions. So 
we do these a lot, right? These exact sessions that we're, we're I'm doing right now with you guys. Like normally we're in the rack as opening casts, um, but I'll have, you know, somebody like John from Irish Moss, for example, will come over and he'll tell me, I want a whiskey that kind of tastes like this. And then we'll spend a day um, formulating vacuums from him and stuff like that. And, and normally we do it kind of one-on-one. -on -one. And there always comes a point in the day or the, day, the second day where somebody goes, why don't we just put them all together and, you know, have a melange? And then everybody walks away and they, they think about it the next day. So the complexity of that, that if we did that, um, well, I'd like to know why you think that. Like, what do you think it would bring out? I'm interested to know, Connor, just if you can answer. What are you getting from that combo? Maybe I'll do the combo myself. Okay. Do we plan on getting in peated malt? Yes, we have. We yeah, we have some already. Yeah, so uh, it's sitting in the rack as some of it. So we have. We're getting more in this year. We also have a bit of pot still. Um, I'm. Well, I won't be releasing either of those anytime soon. They're very young. Uh, they're. I mean, they're over three, but they're very young. So uh, we're looking at kind of. Um, for the pot still, we're looking at a wood program on us to see what we can do with it and take it in a different direction. I'll tell you what we are looking at right now, which is pretty interesting, and you heard it here first, is that we are looking at some, working with some distilleries who are making kind of non-compliant stuff, like that is, is you know, is, is pot still, but isn't pot still, if you know what I mean, like in, a, in accordance with the technical files. So we won't be able to call it Irish whiskey per, or pot still Irish whiskey per se, we can call it something else. But um, yeah, we're working with some guys in relation to some new make on that, which is hopefully coming in next week for tasting. Um, yeah, we have a number of kind of irons on the fire. I am a very big fan of peat and whiskey. You know, I, I spent a lot of time working you know, in big corporations working on some, you know, some, a lot of Islay brands and stuff like that. So peated whiskey for me is a, is a love of mine. And I'd love to see, to, to have some expressions coming out from us, but not for several years. We just don't have the older stock really to make it happen. Um, and it's unlikely we'll do it as a blend, but you never know. We'll see how the whiskey goes. So Christoph wants to know, can he buy those samples again? They're all empty. <laughs> Uh, you have to ask John at Irish Moss because um, I'm I'm not spending a, another four days packing tiny samples <laughs> on my own on the farm. <laughs> um, but what we might like, we you never know. We might do some other. Uh, you know, and this goes back to a very early question about about um, that somebody asked, like, how has your business changed? Your business model changed? It's very likely we'll be doing a lot more sample kits in the future, you know, and I certainly know that Irish Malls have a very exciting, uh, this is not an ad for Irish Malls, by the way, but I do know that they have a very exciting um, project on the go called Three Drams. And I think you'll see the sampling thing from us as well, like independently, it's, it's highly likely we'll do um, a bit more of this kind of um, exclusive sample tasting, sort of going out to people's homes moving forward. Um, but on these ones, no, that, that's probably it. That's probably it, I think. Okay, so when we pick a winner, how many bottles will be made available? It depends on the yield, right? So it's, it's, it's not going to be a lot, guys. I'll tell you that much. It's enough, one for everybody, most certainly plus, but like it... The yield of this is not a yield from four casks because not all of the casks are full. So it's going to be a very limited edition. And um, just by virtue of the fact that the, the yield isn't going to be brilliant. So we will let you know as soon as we pick the blend, um, as soon as the blend is picked, we will send out an email to you guys letting you know exactly what the cask is. Uh, sorry, what the what the, the the pick is, and then we'll be able to calculate immediately. There will be X amount of bottles, so not a lot is the is the is the quick answer. Like it's only four casts; they're not all full, so it's a couple hundred bottles, really. Okay, we have a question in from Dennis. Isn't crowdsourcing making it harder for you to stick to your stick signature style? Um, not really. I mean, you know, we. 
we put these blends together and they're all in the Cory wheelhouse and they're all blends and vattings in particular that like we're comfortable with. You know, that 2006 was picked for a very particular reason is that it's, it's Cory wheelhouse. So um, we're bringing you guys in on the process, but like any one of these, I'd be, you know, it, they're, they're in the Cory, um, they're in kind of the Cory wheelhouse and I'd be happy enough with them, you know. I think the idea with this as well is that it's, it's a good bit of fun to get everybody involved in it. And um, this is going to be a lovely little whiskey. And I think even because of the grain component as well, like that's in it, um, it'll be a lovely sit at home and sip in the summertime or even a, a, a highball kind of a scenario as well, I think. So it's good fun for us. Um, but no, we're, we're happy with the, the, the three that are out there. Okay, we have a question in from our friend Ed Milner. What sort of time scale do you think for the release? Do you envisage COVID putting a spanner in the works with regards to bottling? No, I don't. Right. So one of the big advantages of COVID is that we've had, we haven't had downtime, right? It's been pretty hard going here, to be honest with you. Um, but normally, normally I travel 70% of the year when literally like I'm never here. And everybody else is running around now. Normally in the summer season, we're here in Clare running around to all of our accounts and, and making sure that everybody has whiskey and all that kind of thing. So we've had a lot of time in the last few months to kind of um, just sort of streamline all of our production process and, and get it to a point where it's really kind of well lined up, thank God. And um, so we're actually probably in a lot better position in terms of production and bottling than we were pre-COVID. And a lot of that is through Eric, who I know is on the line. He's, he's there. Eric, Eric kind of manages our production here on site. So um, we, we brought in all manner of like software to manage our inventory and dry goods and stuff like that. So no, it will not stop it. Like we're, if we wanted to, you know, we could bottle it next week after marrying it and all the rest of it and vatting it. But the, the only thing that will slow down this particular bottling will be proofing and a bit of marrying time as well. So you're looking at like a month and a half, Eric would kill me for saying that, but you're looking at like a month and a half, uh, two months to be out the door pretty quick. Okay, we have a question in for Nathan. Will those taking part tonight know which blend is the winner? Yes, we, we, yeah, we'll email you straight away. As soon as you, um, when you get off, this tonight there should be a link in your inbox from us asking you to kind of cast the final vote and what we'll do is like i said we're going to go down through all your comments and everything and take on your feedback about abv and various different bits and pieces and um we'll let you know then what the what the winning blend was um very early this week probably what monday tuesday Eve, or yes so yeah. voting will stay open for 48 hours okay and that email will be in your inbox in the next couple of minutes and we will be announcing at the end of the week. Let's do it on Wednesday. Let's do it on, we'll do it on Wednesday. <laughs> if the boss says Wednesday, we're doing it Wednesday, guys. Okay. <laughs> well, either, like, when, we're going to email you on Wednesday. That's what, that's, we've, we've decided that now. <laughs> For Whiskey Wednesday. For Whiskey Wednesday. On Whiskey Wednesday, hosted by our great friend Tim, we are going to uh, email you all to let you know what the final decision is. And then we'll, we'll keep you updated then. Like you'll get something about the label from us. We'll figure out the ABV on it as well. We'll make a decision on that. Uh, we'll, we'll need a little bit longer on that to figure that out. And um, yeah, we'll just, we'll keep you updated like once a week or whatever, just tell you exactly what's going on. And then, um, yeah, it'd be good to do a live blending session if we could. We'll see if we can try to set up like a live stream Kind of in the blending room when the blending session is going on just for the heck of it and um, that you can just tune in and out of if you want to okay we have a question from mark gray how did you come up with the idea for this session so um it was a it was ver the very beginning of covid when we hadn't even locked down yet i think we were social distancing in <laughs> We were having staff meeting social distancing in the rack house, I think. And there, the, the brief went out to everybody that everybody needed to have a good idea every morning on, on, the, on the company call. Like, how can we evolve? How can we change this? And, and what can we do? 
and uh, and then this kind of, this this came up in one of those meetings and then we kind of looked around like um it has been done before like uh in, certainly in scotch and then our friends over at whistle pig actually did it did it as well um but they kind of announced it just direct, directly after ourselves so it was kind of a team effort um it was it was out of necessity uh we always you know, it would have probably happened anyway, to be honest with you. It's just one of those things that COVID kind of jimmied along. And it makes perfect sense for us to do this because we want you guys as close to the process as we can. But yeah, it's a really good team effort. Okay, so our friend JP Walsh wants to know, Louise, will you do this again? I don't know if you guys want us to. Yeah, we will. Not, not, like, not all the time, but maybe we'll do it once a year. I don't know. It'd be good fun maybe to do it once a year. Definitely let us know in the comments whether you love tonight or not. <laughs> we need your feedback. Yeah, do you want to do it again? Is the answer. You know that 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 would be the the, the answer. It's I think it's um, you know I think I think there's going to be a lot more of this kind of thing in, in the whiskey world. The whiskey world kind of moved online there and and I, during COVID, and I think it's been great. Like we're we're online nearly every night with our friends all over the world. So um, we're happy to do it again. Definitely. We'll have to do something different, though. We'll have to have different cast finishes or something older or something like that. But if we do it again, it would be, like, on steroids. How about that? Okay. Yeah. The bar has been set, people. Okay. <laughs> Ian Scott has a really good question. Would there ever be a batch two of the lock-in if it was successful? Uh, no. No, I think no. No, this is it. Like, that. that this is it. This is, uh, whatever we bottle it, we call the lock-in. There'll be a couple hundred bottles of it. That'll be it. If we do this again, we'll call it something else because I think the lock-in was literally just kind of around this whole COVID piece. So the lock-in, the lock-in is like old Tom. The lock-in might end up becoming my favorite thing now uh, outside of old Tom. So this is a special one for us. It's a once, uh, it's a once off, definitely. <laughs> Tim from Whiskey Wednesdays went, Wednesdays is toying in a cheeky question. Will there be a chosen batch too? No, no. But there will be at some point another uh, lovely uh, design-led kind of uh, single cast from us. But it just depends. We have some casts that are hitting the thirty mark, thirty-two years old, that kind of thing. There, there will be another kind of super beautiful thing from us in the future. Uh, but the, the, it won't be called the chosen two. It'll be something very different, and that certainly won't be this year, and probably not next year. But that is something that we do. If we if we have something that's particularly exceptional, we'll partner with um, some exceptional craftspeople to create something you know e even more exceptional. We like to do that. You know, we I like to hear all Irish whiskey. I like to put it out there as the best, the best, and that's our contribution to that. Um, that was a labor of love, the, the Chosen. It was a beautiful, beautiful project. Okay, the people are speaking and they are saying they definitely want to do another event like this online. Okay, we'll, we'll do it then, definitely. I don't know how. We'll figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> this is how all of our meetings go at JJ Kari. Somebody has an idea at DM and we go, yeah, okay. And then we figure out what it is later. But okay, we'll definitely do it again. But we'll make it super special. We'll make it even better. I think we'll we'll figure out what that means in terms of it'll be a, bu a bunch of different cast styles and finishes and that kind of thing. So we'll definitely do it again. Okay. So Tomo Murphy has a question: Will there be a Kari Dream Cask? Oh, I think the chosen was the Kari Dream Cask. Like, yeah, I think that that's that's what that is for us. And um, we are working. I always talk too much of these things. I always, I always give everything away. We are we we have quite a bit of 1991 stock, right? And uh, not as not as much as the big guys have, but we have some of it. And um, some of it, you know, that that was what the the some of it will be single cast down the line, but a lot of it won't because uh, you know older is always better. Like we have 1991 casts that are like. 41 percent like they're dangerously near the edge kind of 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 going over the not being irish whiskey anymore and um with those kind of casts like they're for blending right so we we have some really interesting 1991 battings that we're working on and i think we'll probably do 
a, quite a, a, a lot more of that kind of thing, sort of older, mature, not single cast stuff, but rather kind of fattings that make them even, you know, as, as some of their parts. So there's, there's a there's a good bit of that in our future, I think. Um, but yeah, The Chosen was our dream cast, I think, and we'll probably do something like it again moving forward. I think a few people are definitely on board for more 91, especially after our Twitter tasting with Top Drum. Yeah, the, the 1991 stocks that we have are, pff, they blow your mind, right? They're really good. They're, and you can't get them anymore. Like they're super rare. And um, they're very, they're, they're I, I did the calculation, like they're, the, they're, they're crazy. Like you, they're just so rare, they're inaccessible almost at this point. But we have quite a few of them, luckily, because um, we bought, we got them in like 2015, I think. So everybody's saying they have really enjoyed tonight, which is awesome. Great. All right, look, I think we'll, we'll start wrapping it up. So the logistics are now that when you come off this, I think there'll be an email just about in your inbox right now that will ask you to vote for um, your favorite blend, one, two, or three. Um, then uh, we need a 48 hours. We'll leave it open for about 48 hours so you can get your vote in. And then we'll let you know at the end of day on Wednesday um, exactly what's been picked. And then we'll, we'll know by then, I think, exactly what the yield will be approximately anyway. So we'll let you know. And um, then we'll keep you involved in the process. So. Um, you know, we won't spam you, but we'll make sure that you're aware of uh, what the progress is and what's happening and when you can, uh, when it's going to be available on Irish Malls. And we'll make sure that you guys have first dibs on it um, if you're kind enough to, to want to buy a bottle. Um, and I think we'll definitely do this again. I think this was fun. Um, again, I really appreciate all of your support. Um, I hope we've kind of uh, lightened your Sunday night a little bit. And with any luck, this will be the last of the lock-in blends that we ever have to do. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Do you want to give away 